The internet is something most of us use as a part of our day-to-day -day lives. It allows us to keep in touch with people anywhere in the world, stay up to date with current events, and keep us entertained. With so much going on, there are many unsolved and creepy things on the internet that can attract the attention of online sleuths. Many of these internet mysteries go unsolved, but with enough time and investigation, many can be solved. Number 10. Sometimes the simplest of internet mysteries can lead to the biggest rabbit holes until those mysteries are finally solved. In 2020, a now deleted post appeared on the conspiracy subreddit titled I just typed paranoia.com on Google and it redirected me to Disney's website. The user went on to explain how they were looking at a strange organization and the Wikipedia page said they were affiliated with paranoia.com in 1995. The website hosted other sites that were controversial and bordered on being illegal. When the user tried to do more research on the topic, he was directed to Disney and could find little other information. Given the subreddit this post first appeared on, it's not surprising that there were some wild theories about why this could be. The implication seemed to be that Disney was involved in some of the controversial activities that Paranoia.com had become known for. The subject then appeared on the Internet Mysteries subreddit board. The discussion here was much less conspiracy theory focused, but an answer for why Paranoia.com redirected to Disney couldn't be found. The main theory was that Disney had purchased the website for an upcoming project that had been abandoned. But it isn't standard practice for Disney to buy the .com addresses for their movie names. On top of this, there didn't seem to be any evidence for a Disney project called Paranoia. The answer to this mystery can be explained by looking back through the site's history. While the original site isn't accessible today, it can be found using the Wayback Machine, although even this will try to redirect users to captures of the Disney website. The original Paranoia.com is a trip into the very early days of the internet. It was online from at least 1994 to around 1998, and was designed to be a place to escape from internet censorship. The site was run by a man named Kevin TX, based in Austin, Texas, and offered users a place to host their own websites, with topics ranging from politics to religion to art. The homepage came with a warning that people might find the topics here offensive. If there was any singular focus, it was on free speech on the internet and fighting against censorship. But in 1998, the homepage was replaced with a statement saying that Paranoia.com was being closed down and that most of the individual pages would have messages informing users of their new location. The next capture on the Wayback Machine comes from 2001, when the site was changed to a generic web portal under the name Excite. This was the case throughout 2001, but by 2003, the address had started to redirect to go.com, a Disney web portal. This meant that Disney didn't purchase the domain from this creepy, controversial website, but from Excite. That still didn't explain why Disney had purchased it, though. It was speculated that Disney hadn't actually purchased the domain name itself, but that one of the companies Disney bought had purchased the domain name before the acquisition. Sifting through the amount of companies Disney owned seemed like an impossible task, but internet investigator Kylie Bogley managed to crack the case. For two months in 2000, Fox Family had run a game show called Paranoia, involved one contestant in the studio going up against contestants competing over the internet by phone. Those contestants competing online would play along live using the website paranoia.excite.com. There are no web archives from this period, but it can be assumed that during this time, the address showed the Paranoia Game Show. When the game show was no longer live, Fox Family still owned the domain name, but it redirected to the generic Excite portal. When Disney purchased the company that owned Fox, it became the owner of the domain name for this long-abandoned game show. Now, the Paranoia.com mystery has been solved. It's clear this was much less mysterious and creepy than it first appeared when it was highlighted on the conspiracy subreddit. Number 9. The dead internet conspiracy theory is the theory that the vast majority of users on the internet are not real. It's similar to some real-world counterparts where everyone except one individual is fake and they're the only real person. When it comes to the internet, there are so many bots and AI posts out there that it can be easy to see why someone would believe such a theory. 
In 2022, a three-part investigation by the Indian news outlet The Wire seemed to uncover an app that was making the conspiracy theory a reality. When it comes to internet mysteries, many concern just how something is possible, and that was the case with the mysterious app known as TechFog. It began in January of 2022, at the end of a two-year investigation by journalists at The Wire. The news outlet is owned by the Foundation for Independent Journalism and aimed to be free from corporate and political influences. So if there was an app limiting the free speech and independent thought of the public, this was the sort of outlet that would report on it. According to the report, TechFog was something of a wonder app, able to take advantage of gaps in security measures for some of the biggest social media sites and technology companies. The app supposedly had many uses. One of the primary uses was to create a massive amount of users on social media sites. Then these could be used to hijack the trending sections of these websites. It could all be done with the click of a button. It meant that all the verification and lengthy sign-up processes for these various sites were useless in stopping the spam and hate. On top of this, the accounts could all be deleted at once. Again, this would normally be a drawn-out process as the sites try to keep their users. But TechFog made this simple and easy. It wasn't just social media that the app took advantage of. It supposedly used a virus to infiltrate WhatsApp accounts and then used inactive accounts to spam people. The target would be sent a multimedia file from an unknown contact. This then introduced the virus to the phone. From that point onwards, TechFog could monitor the WhatsApp account. The people behind the app would then wait until the account was no longer active and then use the account to send fake news to the contacts. According to the whistleblower who spoke to The Wire, they were capable of using active WhatsApp accounts, but waited until they were inactive so the target would be less likely to notice. Of course, their friends would then all notice these strange messages, so it's not clear how this went undetected for very long. This wasn't the only hole in the reporting, though, and a lot of technology writers were curious about how such an app could work. The report was written by two technology writers, and there was a lot of jargon that the average person wouldn't understand, but even those trained in the field couldn't make much sense of it. It would eventually emerge that this was because it all wasn't real. According to The Wire, it was all created by one of the authors, Devesh Kumar. Kumar had allegedly wanted to discredit The Wire and published a series of articles to do just that. The mysterious tech fog was invented for this purpose. One of the reasons why it came under scrutiny was because there was no evidence that the journalists had seen tech fog in action. There were only screenshots of menus showing the various abilities. The one demonstration they did get was the infiltration of a WhatsApp account, with a hacked account sending messages to the user's contacts. But that account that was supposedly hacked belonged to Kumar. It would be possible that Kumar sent those messages himself and wasn't hacked at all. While TechFog did leave people questioning the authenticity of their news and the dangers of social media manipulation, it turned out there was no singular wonder app behind it all. Number 8. Few events in recent times have been the subject of as many conspiracy theories as the disappearance of Malaysian Airlines flight MH370. One of these conspiracy theories began with an internet mystery, which baffled people before being debunked. On March 8, 2014, a regular passenger flight from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing disappeared without a trace somewhere over the Indian Ocean. It became a major international incident, with ships and aircraft from the surrounding countries all searching for the missing plane. It was only years later that pieces of wreckage were found washed ashore in Africa. It remains one of the few unsolved air disappearances. While today it's relatively certain that the plane ended up in the water, in 2018, there were still many theories that something more sinister, or possibly supernatural, happened. It was just after the fourth anniversary of this terrible event that a new mystery began. A Twitter user going by the name of Ty posted a recording of a chilling voicemail they had just received. The message sounded like a robotic voice reading lots of random words and a string of numbers that didn't seem to make any sense. It didn't take users long to realize that this was the NATO phonetic alphabet. When translated, it said S Danger SOS. It's dire for you to evacuate. Be cautious, they are not human. SOS Danger SOS. Another user commented that the string of numbers seemed to be coordinates, 
and were actually of a location close to where the Malaysian Airlines flight disappeared from radar. Some people began to speculate that this mysterious voicemail could have been in some way connected to the flight's disappearance. The user who received the voicemail also received two other messages, which only added to the authenticity. The first was a strange incident that occurred before they even received the message. A car pulled up alongside his house in the middle of the night, and the occupant began taking photos of his home with the flash on. The second was a message sent to the user on Twitter. In Malaysian, it read, end the post you just shared about the recording on your phone. The main theory was that this was some kind of recording stored on MH370's black box on repeat. An electromagnetic storm had caused it to be sent out as a voicemail, which the Twitter user then received. Later, a message using dots and dashes to symbolize Morse code was sent out. When translated, it talked about Stephen Hawking's being connected to the message. Another message alluded to something bad happening in April of 2018. It didn't take long for most of the theories surrounding this to be debunked. The biggest problem with the black box theory was that black boxes don't work in this way. Rather than a message of any kind, it would have broadcast a beeping noise, and this would have only lasted a few months after the plane's disappearance. There was no way that some electromagnetic interference would have caused someone's phone to receive this. Another problem was the fact that if a warning message did need to be broadcast, it wouldn't be done using the NATO alphabet. Other parts of the mystery began to fall away. The user who sent the message about Stephen Hawking revealed they were pulling a prank and just trying to promote their SoundCloud. But where the original voicemail came from remained a mystery. That was until it was revealed that it was sent using a voice over IP service, traced to a hotel in Port Blair. The whole thing was a hoax, seemingly orchestrated by the initial Twitter user. Even those who didn't believe it was real speculated that this might have been the beginning of some kind of ARG or alternate reality game. But there was never any follow-up on this, and it seems like the whole thing was a simple hoax. Number 7. Many strange internet mysteries start their life on 4chan. The site is generally free from moderation, and users can post anonymously without much trouble. This means that a lot of creepy and disturbing content is posted, and it's harder to track the post history here than on a traditional social media site. Most of these mysteries fade into obscurity and don't often have much to them to begin with. But the story of Alex from Tennessee captured the imagination of internet sleuths around the web who wanted to get to the bottom of the mystery. In April of 2013, a mysterious anonymous user started a series of strange posts. It began with coordinates to an abandoned building in Elizabethton, Tennessee, with instructions to park nearby and walk to this point to claim a prize, which was under plastic. Other users began joking about what the prize might be, obviously not taking it seriously. This wouldn't be the first time someone posted something ominous on 4chan with the intention of creeping someone out. But Anon kept posting, trying to tempt someone to come. His response included, it's warm, and no cops here, with a smiling face. Then the weird post took a turn for the disturbing, with chilling images attached to messages asking why nobody would come. Anon started talking about a friend, which others believed to be someone who'd passed away. Anon assured them that his friend wasn't the prize, and showed a black plastic bag that contained the prize. After a few more posts, the Anon disappeared, never to be heard from again. Five days later, someone decided to take him up on his creepy invitation. This user identified himself as Alex from Tennessee. He said he had gone to the location shown in the original message, and he was going to do some snooping. What followed was 20 eerie updates as Alex moved around the dirt basement of an abandoned building. He photographed the random assortment of items that he came across, which included green bottles that made him think something was being grown there. He also found bottles of medication that were decades old, hidden in beams above his head. Eventually, Alex came across the plastic bag, which contained what looked like the remains of a small animal and a folded paper plate. Inside was a hard drive, and written on the plate was the phrase, Plates a date, a very important mate. You shouldn't have come here, I lied. Almost immediately, Alex heard a noise coming from above him, and informed the 4chan thread that he was going to try to find another way out. He claimed to have found a crawl space and a window, but then discovered the window was just a vent. His final message was that he was going to go back through the main door, the same one that the mysterious newcomer would be approaching. 
Like the original Anon, Alex from Tennessee then disappeared without a trace. For years, there's been speculation about what happened to him. Some theorized that he might have been kidnapped or had his life taken by the original poster to become his new, quote, friend. A search of missing person databases and news sites from the time showed nobody by the name of Alex going missing in the area. He could have used another name, but there didn't seem to be any other evidence that a disappearance connected to the post had taken place. Internet sleuths visited the location shown in the messages. They found a typical abandoned building. There were some items like clothes belonging to homeless people, but not much else. The creepy items shown in the 4chan posts were nowhere to be seen. Others attempted to recreate the time span for the posts Alex made. There was very little time between each one, and it took Alex almost no time to write the captions for each post. To achieve what he had done, he would have been constantly on his phone while looking through a creepy abandoned building he didn't know, and while trying to escape it. By now, the mystery of Alex from Tennessee has basically been debunked, but that doesn't stop it from being a creepy internet rabbit hole. Number 6. Some of the strangest internet mysteries are those that seem to involve puzzles or user interaction of some kind. The mysterious Cicada 3301 was the most famous of these and remains unsolved to this day, but it wasn't the only one of its kind. A lot of these eventually turned out to be ARGs, and that was the general consensus with another of the strangest mysteries to come about a little before Cicada. But the website explicitly claimed it wasn't an ARG along with a lot of other things that it wasn't. Users were left wondering what exactly Neurocam was. In the mid-2000s, people in the Melbourne suburb of North Fitzroy noticed a strange billboard. In black text on an orange background, there was the phrase, Get out of your mind. Beneath it was a web address, Neurocam.com. Those who visited the website were greeted with a registration page, encouraging people who wanted more information to enter their name and email where they would be contacted by Neurocam operatives. People who filled this out were given a list of missions to complete. Some were told to deface the billboard with their answer to the question, what is Neurocam? Others had to collect items from other operatives, print cards promoting Neurocam, and in one case, collect the autograph from a supermodel who was part of the game. At no point did they get an answer as to what Neurocam was. Even when those claiming to be high-level operatives gave an interview to the news outlet The Age, that question wasn't answered. The operatives claimed Neurocam was an unveiling, and it depended on the person. Most speculated that it was some kind of ARG, even though the site explicitly said that it wasn't. Interest in Neurocam appeared again in 2013, when a blog titled WTF is Neurocam was launched. It was written by someone who'd become fascinated by the Neurocam mystery and joined the organization to try to get to the bottom of it. He, too, didn't find an answer. One of the clues uncovered early on was the name Robert Henley, who'd been the head of Neurocam's operations in Melbourne. In 2001, a performance artist named Robin Helley produced a video with Henley as a subject, and many speculated that Robin Helley might be involved. His name also cropped up in discussions about Cicada 3301, when that project was launched in 2012. This was the clue that would unravel the mystery. In 2012, Helly published his thesis, Project Neurocam, an investigation. In the abstract, Helly describes Neurocam as an online interactive project made by myself. He wanted to answer the question of whether this project is art and who is the author of it. Even though he created Neurocam, a lot of the work was done by operatives, who were people who just wanted to answer the question of what Neurocam was. His thesis was written in the form of what he calls fictocriticism, a mixture of fiction, theory, and criticism. The blog written by the Neurocam operative, trying to get to the bottom of the mystery, was included in his thesis, as Halley himself had written the blog. Some have speculated that the thesis was actually just an assignment ordered by Neurocam, and another way of hiding the truth. In other interviews, Helis claimed that he wasn't responsible for Neurocam but played a large role in it, but it seems more likely this was just him adding to the mystery of the project. No matter how curious someone might be about an ARG, it seems extreme to go through an entire PhD process for it.
Neurochem was a strange art project that captured the imaginations of many and may have inspired future ARGs in the process. Number 5. With the popularity of doorbell cameras and home CCTV, one of the questions often posed to those who believe in the supernatural is why none of this has been clearly caught on camera. In June of 2019, a strange video went viral online, which many speculated may have achieved just that. The video was posted by Colorado mother Vivian Gomez to her Facebook page. The caption stated that she'd come across the video on Sunday morning. She said, quote, First I saw the shadow walking from my front door. Then I saw this thing. Has anyone else seen this on their cameras? The other two cameras didn't pick it up for some reason. Attached was a 10-second black and white video that showed the front driveway of the family home. A short, thin creature wanders away from the house with a strange gait and then starts what looks like a dance. The clip abruptly shuts off before a clear image of a person's face is seen. The main reason why the video caught so much attention was the creature's head. It seemed to have two large ears and resembled the house elf characters from the Harry Potter franchise. The clip was shared on social media to the cryptid subreddit. While it was unlikely that this was a fictional character that came to life, some speculated that it might have been a genuine cryptid or an alien creature. The original poster insisted that it wasn't CGI or edited in any way, and experts tended to agree with her. Some people speculated that this might have been a part of some viral marketing campaign. The following day, a trailer for a Harry Potter-themed augmented reality game was released, but Gomez didn't seem to be in any way related to the game, and there were no follow-up clips of other creatures from the franchise appearing on CCTV. Those who didn't believe this was genuine thought it might be a puppet of some kind, which could explain why it wasn't caught on any other cameras. This explanation was also brushed aside, as the shuffling motion would have been impossible to replicate, and the sound effects lined up with someone actually being there. Despite the video appearing on news sites around the world, and Gomez being interviewed on her mysterious video, it didn't take sleuths long to figure out the answer. This was simply a person wearing a t-shirt over their head. Gomez's friends even speculated that it might have been her son, who has the same build as the mysterious creature. An audio expert was even able to determine that a voice that's heard at the very end of the footage sounds as if it's coming from inside the house, and it's likely that the strange display was seen in real time. The entire thing wasn't too mysterious at all, but it did manage to fool a lot of people, and some still believe it to be evidence of the paranormal. Number 4 in June of 2007, YouTube user Devin Raymond posted a chilling ghost hunting video to his channel. According to the description, the footage was recorded during his tenure as a special guest and resident expert to another ghost hunting group. He went on to say that his association with the group ended for reasons he couldn't get into, and he wasn't allowed to name the location where the footage was recorded. The video showed the group exploring an apparently abandoned building at night. They open a door labeled as East Wing Stairway and shine a light down the corridor. At this moment, a strange noise could be heard. The video replays it three times, each time more enhanced or slowed down. According to the captions on the video, the voice says, I have the body of a pig and grunts. According to text shown on screen, nobody in the party heard the voice at the time. After the voice was picked up, the group took photos through the door. This photo then appeared on screen, which seemed to show a demonic creature crawling towards the group. The chilling video amassed over a million views, with many finding it one of the more terrifying pieces of paranormal footage. It was discussed on the Unexplained Mysteries forum, where one of the users contacted the uploader for more information. Devin responded, saying that he was unable to name the location because it was purchased by a housing developer, who turned the location into expensive apartments. It had previously been an asylum with confused and dangerous patients, but had long been abandoned when Devin and the team began to explore. According to Devin, the owners don't know about the video, although he did compile a report on paranormal activity, which was taken away from him on the advice of a solicitor. Speculation about the footage included theories that it might have been the ghost of someone unhappy with their appearance in life, or that it was a reference to the biblical story of Jesus casting a group of demons into pigs. Another theory was that the EVP actually said, I have a body on a pig farm, and that there could have been some disturbing incident that took place at a nearby farm. 
While the video did seem compelling at first, it has unfortunately been debunked. By speeding up the audio, investigators found that the supposed EVP sounded a lot like one of the investigators in the video. The photo shown at the end of the video also doesn't match what is seen in the actual footage. On top of this, they also found that Devin's YouTube channel was filled with obviously faked ghost footage. The video may have been debunked, but as one user on Unexplained Mysteries forums states, fake or not, it's still scary. Number 3. The Strange Mystery of 1-800-GOLF-TIPS is a case that started online but was talked about on forums and message boards in the early days of the internet. From the 1990s onwards, it's remained a curious unsolved case that internet sleuths have been trying to get to the bottom of. Confirmation of what it really was was only uncovered in 2019. In late 1994, billboards appeared around the Canadian province of Ontario. The large posters were brightly colored and featured a golf club, a ball, and a green. In yellow writing was the phone number, 1-800-GOLF-TIPS, and no other information. It wasn't really out of place. According to one Reddit user who lived in the area at the time, the area was trying to promote its golfing facilities and advertise itself to players. This just seemed like another part of the brand being built around the area. It was only after someone tried to phone the number that things started to get creepy. Being a 1-800 number, it was toll-free, which meant that it attracted the attention of bored teenagers with little else to do. A few curious people called the number, expecting to hear something golf-related. Instead, what they got was an eerie recording of a man counting to 10. The recording repeated over and over again, but if a listener stayed on the line long enough, they would hear what sounded like a loud screeching siren. Once people had heard the creepy recording, it didn't take long for stories about the phone number to spread. It was mostly the subject of conversation between teenagers, who would speculate about what it was actually about and try to get friends to also call 1-800-GOLF-TIPS. While the billboards did seem to be focused in the Ontario area, it wasn't only here that the mysterious 1-800-GOLF-TIPS was talked about. Across North America, people were calling this creepy, almost urban legend-like number, and later sharing their experiences on the internet. Eventually, the number was taken down, and people would no longer be able to experience the creepy counting or the siren noise. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to have been any recordings of what was heard that have been posted online, although some have recreated it. With the phone number no longer up, the focus of conversation surrounding 1-800-GOLF-TIPS was who was behind it and what it actually was. It was a question that nobody seemed to have an answer for, though there were lots of theories. Some suggested it might have been a way to collect phone numbers. These could then be added to marketing lists for telemarketers. But there was never any information collected about the caller. It would be impossible to use this for targeted marketing, as it wasn't even possible to identify whether the phone number was attached to a payphone or someone's personal device. Another theory was that it was some kind of viral marketing. These kinds of campaigns aren't unheard of today, but they do generally push people towards a product or service. In this case, there was no call to action that would get callers to whoever was behind the marketing. Those more conspiracy-minded speculated that it may have been some kind of number station, or even used for mind control purposes. But the answer was much more simple. In 2019, a website dedicated to news and updates about payphones uncovered the truth. It was a small blurb in the December 3rd, 1994 issue of the Tampa Tribune, which talks about 1-800-GOLF-TIPS. For one weekend only, between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., golfers could call the hotline to receive tips from professional golfers. It was organized by the PGA of America and USA Today, and was part of a promotion of a summit about golf teaching. A Reddit user who'd been investigating the case for years speculated that the billboards were simply cheap and had stayed up longer than the PGA had rented them for, as nobody else had acquired them. When the PGA golf tip service went offline, it was replaced by a message. The so-called creepy voice was just a technician, and the siren was a sound used by telephone companies when a phone had been off the hook for too long. Now that the truth about 1-800-GOLF-TIPS has been brought into the light, it's clear that what made the mystery so creepy was the unknown. Number 2. The Gitas case was an online mystery that many people believed would never be solved. 
But the dedicated work of online sleuths and the Endless Threads podcast finally got answers to questions about this strange fantasy character. On June 21st, 2017, comedian and late-night show writer Nate Fernald posted a tweet that would start this strange online mystery. It featured a photo of an old 80s-style enamel pin of a weird creature with the name Gitas beneath it. Nate explained that he'd found this pin, but neither he nor Google had any idea what Gitas was. Now he was asking for help in identifying the creature. Nate would later explain that he was searching eBay for a pin of the band The Jam when he came across a seller with hundreds of pins related to 70s and 80s pop culture. Among them was the Gitas pin. At first, he thought nothing of it, but then he realized he'd never heard of this thing and decided on a whim to purchase it. The seller had no idea where Gitas was from, and neither did any of Nate's friends. When he reached out to the internet, there was no answer, but people were keen to get to the bottom of the mystery. As often is the case with internet mysteries, a subreddit dedicated to cracking it was set up, and more information was pieced together. Someone on Twitter sent Nate a photo of a sticker sheet that featured Gitas. It was labeled The Land of Ta, and was made up of five stereotypical-looking fantasy creatures. All wouldn't have looked out of place in an 80s cartoon or some Dungeons & Dragons manual. But there's no evidence that these creatures had been in either, and The Land of Ta didn't seem to be anything at all. Another sticker sheet was found called Women of Ta, which featured stereotypical female fantasy creatures. The sticker sheet would be an important clue. It was made by Denison, in 1981. At first, that didn't seem to be helpful, as Denison, or Avery Denison, as it's now known, couldn't be reached for comment. But the Endless Threads podcast managed to get access that would finally solve the riddle. They visited the Framingham History Center, which had an archive of Denison stickers and old catalogs. Sure enough, the Land of Ta sticker sheet could be found in these catalogs, alongside sheets of food, animals, and a sheet of spaceships that resembled crafts from Star Wars. The last sheet was another hint at what the Land of Ta was. None of the ships in the sheet were actually from the Star Wars franchise, but could generously be described as being inspired by the movie. The podcast also talked to former workers of the Denison Company and received a list of names of artists who'd worked on stickers during this time period. Among those was Sam Petrucci, Petrucci was a prolific artist in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. His most famous work would be the original box artwork for the G.I. Joe action figure, a doll he'd actually pitched to Hasbro before it was produced. As well as this, he'd produced artwork for Dungeons & Dragons. His work at the Denison Company ranged from cute baby animals to holiday stickers, and of course, the Land of Ta. Endless Threads got in touch with Petrucci's children, who were able to uncover the original artwork the Land of Ta sheet was made from. It seemed that the creatures were all original creations by Petrucci, inspired by his work for actual fantasy franchises. Petrucci appeared to be especially proud of these, as the original artwork was mounted and signed by him. He didn't give his creatures names, and this was apparently added by Denison. The only part of this mystery that hasn't been solved is the pens. Denison didn't create enamel pins, but as Petrucci seemed to be especially proud of his work, it's possible he did this himself. But the mystery of who, or what Gitas is, has finally been solved. Number 1. The Glitter Industry is a surprisingly secretive and lucrative business. There are only a handful of manufacturers around the world. The manufacturers keep the process and details of their business a closely guarded secret. So, when a New York Times article in 2018 explored this secretive industry, it led to one of the biggest online mysteries, with thousands of people wanting to know the answer to a simple question. Which industry is the largest purchaser of glitter? The New York Times article in question was written in December of 2018 by Katie Weaver. Katie went to Glitterax, one of the largest glitter companies in the world. The company wouldn't let her see the glitter being made, or even the machines and there were certain questions that couldn't be answered. The one that caught people's attention was, can you tell me which industry serves as Glitterex's biggest market? The answer was a plain no. The person Katie interviewed said they wouldn't even give an answer off the record after the piece had been published. They did say that Katie would never guess what the answer was, and that they couldn't reveal the truth because the industry didn't want people to know there was glitter in the products. This led many Reddit users down a rabbit hole to try to get an answer to the mystery. 
There were a variety of theories about the answer. Some speculated that it might have been some kind of food manufacturing, or that the glitter was purchased to be deliberately dumped on beaches to make the sand sparkle. Others thought it might have been some kind of military purpose, such as helping to cloak jets from radar. This would be dismissed as it wasn't even scientifically feasible. One answer that came up early on was vehicle paint. The fact that the interviewee tried to change the conversation by steering Katie towards the automotive grade pigments might have been a subtle hint. It took the investigative work of Endless Threads podcast to finally get an answer. They followed up on many of the theories, only for each one to be debunked. A man who'd previously worked at another glitter company suggested car paint, but this was also ruled out. Finally, the answer came when the show's producer got in touch with a Glitter X client. While the client said they didn't buy that much glitter, they were in a better position to ask the question that everyone wanted answered, and they got a response. The industry that purchased the most glitter was boat manufacturers. It turned out that manufacturers would purchase thousands of gallons of glitter to be mixed with the gel coating that covers the fiberglass that boats are made from. While the glitter on speedboats and jet skis might be obvious, larger cruise ships might not seem to be coated in the reflective plastic. Keeping the paint in pristine condition and making sure that the glitter was spread across the surface would take a large amount of the substance. This mystery may be solved, but there are plenty of other questions surrounding the glitter industry that remain unanswered. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.